What I'm going to tell you about is about uh, some uh, to discuss about uh, whether we uh, require complex numbers in quantum theory. So this was a change that I had um, at the very last minute about putting the title as a question. But if you read my abstract or you know the article, you know the answer to the question. If not, I will provide it during my talk. And this is uh, something that is a collaboration uh, among several people. So there is a. Uh, Armin, who is now here in Vienna, he was with Nicolas Gisan, who arrived, uh, he should be there, yes. Thank you, Nicolas, merci. And then uh, there is uh, a lot of people from, uh, also from uh, Vienna, from Miguel Navasquez group. So there is uh, David, Miriam, Mir Miriam, and uh, Antin. And there is Miguel Navasquez, who is on holidays. I, I was uh, hoping to meet him, to meet him but he, is, uh, he knew I was coming and he left. And then uh, also there are people from ICFO, so there is Marc Olivier, who is uh, now postdoc in my group. And, and... So uh, let me start by uh, putting this question. So whether uh, we need uh, complex numbers uh, in physics. OK, so when I say physics, let's say I'm thinking about whether we need a first approach to this question. Uh, is rather boring, I would say, no? So what is, I mean, you may say that physics, okay, it's an experimental uh, discipline, mostly. So you want to describe uh, experiments, okay? And experiments, okay, without, I mean, experiments are just described by the, the effects, the, the statistics you see in the experiment, okay? And then, so, I mean, usually this is just a representation, very uh, minimalistic representation of experiment. You have devices that prepare particles in a given state and then you make measurements on these particles and you get results so often we represent these by boxes no and you have different preparations that you label with a, an index that goes from one to p possible preparations and then you perform some actions that you can see as a measurements and then as a result of this action you you observe a result that we label again with uh, something that goes from one to r and then you repeat this experiment, you count frequencies. Well, I don't know, it depends on what, how you want to process information. And somehow you, you collect everything into some probabilities no, that are of getting a given result here, R1 and R2, when you prepare something here called by P and you made the measurement M1 and M2. And this is the statistic of the experiment. So as such, if what you want to do is to describe what's going on in the experiment, you don't need the complex numbers because you use real numbers to define probabilities. Okay, so this is a, again, I don't think there is anything ultra deep in what I'm saying. But now, uh, if you think about physics, of course, we want to uh, reproduce experiments, but we also want to explain them. And, uh, and for that, we make theories. OK, and then uh, with th we use theories to explain experiments and we also use theories to predict new experiments. OK, and this is this gets closer to uh, the goal of my talk. OK, so then if you specify a given theory, then the question uh, may become more interesting. Okay, so for instance, uh, if you have this experiment and you want to use to model this using quantum theory, the standard quantum theory that perhaps we are uh, more used to in quantum information theory, well, you will say that this is something preparing states, okay? So you will assign a density matrices to these preparations, you see rho p, and then you will assign a measurement here. And if you believe that these are two independent measurements, you, know, you will put a tensor product and you will have another measurement here. So you uh, attribute using your theory, you put objects within your theory, you assign uh, mathematical objects to the elements in your experiment, and then you describe it, okay, you explain it through uh, objects in your theory. Okay, so in particular, in the case of quantum theory, well, you, we know that probabilities are computed through the bone rule and you combine the state with the measurement, you put a tensor product because they are separated and so on and so on. So you have some rules that tell you how to combine the elements to describe uh, the statistics of an experiment. Okay, so this is what I mean by constructing a physical theory. Now, uh, if you think about physical theories between uh, quantum theory, okay, none of these theories was uh, making use of uh, complex numbers. Okay, so I don't know if you think... Um, Newtonian physics, electromagnetism, the, I mean, complex numbers do not appear in the formulation of the theory, although sometimes they were used to simplify, I mean, they don't play any essential role there. I mean, sometimes they are used to simplify calculations, no? For instance, often we use, uh, uh, for the electromagnetic uh, wave, no? We use complex numbers to simplify calculations, but there is nothing fundamental. So actually, quantum theory is the first, to my knowledge, theory that was really formulated in which you see complex numbers from the very beginning, okay? So if this is the, say, 
uh, rather standard formulation. But this is the standard Hilbert space formulation of quantum theory. And when, in my talk, whenever I, I, I would say quantum theory, I will refer to this. Okay, so something formulated in terms of Hilbert spaces. And usually we take complex Hilbert spaces. Okay. So if you open any textbook on quantum physics, these are the postulates you find. And from the very beginning, you have complex Hilbert spaces, and then you say that the state is specified by a vector in this space. Well, I'm, I mean, this is, you can also do it with for mixed states. Okay, I'm just taking the more academic uh, formulation of the theory in terms of pure states, and then measurements are given by orthogonal projectors. Probabilities are computed through the Born rule, and you compose system with the tensor product. Okay, so I'm going to take this, um, this postulate, uh, say, as the ones defining a quantum theory, and I'm going to wonder about this part here. Okay, so you can say that quantum theory is this uh, with Hilbert space, and now I wonder if I really need to say that uh, I need a complex or real numbers. Okay, so this is the question I want I want to answer. Okay, because it could be that a wave function, a wave, uh, we use complex numbers in the same way that we use complex numbers for the electromagnetic wave. Okay, so it could be that it's something that we use because it simplifies our lives. But maybe there is nothing fundament there is nothing fundamental in the choice of these uh, 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 complex numbers. Okay, it could be as it happens for the electromagnetic wave. And this is not new. Okay, so uh, I don't know who found uh, among the authors who found this, but I think this is perfect to illustrate what I'm, I want to tell you. Okay, so there was a letter from Schrödinger to Lorenz where he, I mean, he had problems with this. Okay, because well, he I would say he hoped. Okay that psi, not the wave function, is uh, at the very end a real function, not complex. Okay. okay, this is our motivation. Okay, we want to understand if, say, Schrodinger is right when writing this or not. We have to uh, live with complex numbers. So, well, this is the question I want to answer. Okay, so what happens if now I take the previous postulates, I replace complex by real. Okay, so this, the, these are the postulates. Now I want to have real here space. Can I still explain experiments using this theory, this real quantum theory? Okay, so if my talk, if I say real quantum theory, I will be referring to this theory phrase in terms of objects uh, acting or uh, defined on real Hilbert spaces. And well, I mean, there are people who have been working on these things, for instance. Well, I chose this uh, paper because uh, paper that I know, but. Uh, Probably I'm omitting many people who were working on, on this uh, problem. Okay, so, and when I say that whether I need, well, this is what I want to know, okay? I want to know if I can replace complex numbers by real numbers in the, in the postulates of the theory. And then if the resulting theory leads to the same experimental predictions, okay? If it leads to the same experimental predictions, it means that I don't really need uh, complex numbers, okay? Because I can explain the same experiments with the same theory, with, with this different theory, sorry. And if not, then it means that there is an experiment that I cannot explain with real quantum theory, which means that I can falsify real quantum theory. Okay, in the same way as the Bell test falsify classical models. Okay, so this is why I can say no. So if, if, if I cannot see any gap between real and complex quantum theory or standard complex quantum theory, it means that complex number is just a tool that simplifies our calculation. Okay, and if not, well, I can argue that they are needed uh, for quantum theory. So there are some remarks here that are important. So there are uh, theories or frameworks uh, that are that use real numbers that give the same predictions as quantum physics, Bohm's theory. Okay, so this is just a theory in which uh, you can, uh, uh, that has the same predictive power as uh, what uh, the standard complex quantum theory, okay? Well, I would say this is interesting to look for these theories, but this is not the question I'm interested in because by definition, okay, these theories, if you construct a theory to have the same predictive power as uh, quantum theory, well, this, whether you prefer one theory or the other is just a matter of preference, but the question is unfalsifiable. Okay, so I'm not interested in these things. Well, it could be that it could be, you know, that real and complex quantum theory, whether you prefer one or the other, is also unfalsifiable. Okay, so this is what I'm going to address in my talk. But okay, I'm not interested in this. Okay, so I'm not interested in theories that by construction have the same uh, power. Also, uh, here there is an issue with dimension. Of course, we know that to specify a complex number, I need two real numbers, okay? So I think 
if you bound the dimension of my spaces, well, it's not surprising that I will find a gap between complex and uh, real quantum theory. Okay, and in fact, there are papers showing that the gap appears when you fix. I mean, there are things that you can do with uh, qubit um, complex quantum theory that you cannot do with qubit real quantum theory. Okay, but this is, I would say, I don't see anything ultra fundamental in that. Okay, so this is just telling you that you save dimension by using complex numbers, which is not surprising. Okay, and I, I'm also, I don't see anything, say, ultra fundamental, because at the very end, dimension is not something that you can experiment. I mean, you can, you can never be sure about dimension, okay? So I think this was discussed in the, one of the talks this morning, okay? So you can never, you may think that you are using um, uh, a two-dimensional degree of freedom of a photon or of a particle, but you can never be sure about this, okay? So you can prove that the best you can hope to say about dimension is to put a lower bound on it. Okay, if you even think about it, any system has infinite, potentially infinite degrees of freedom. Okay, so I don't think dimension plays, uh, dimension should not play any role in, in these discussions. And also, as it happens for a bell test, it's convenient to see uh, what, I, what I'm going to say as a game between a complex and a real quint. So there is a, a believer in quant complex quantum physicists and there is a believer in, in real uh, quantum physicists, okay? And they are fighting. So in the same way as for a bell test, you have the person who believes in quantum theory and the other one who believes in EPR, local hidden variable models, and there is, it is a game. And then the complex quantum theories here has to propose a setup for which the real quantum theories cannot find an explanation, okay? And then the complex quantum theories wins the game. If the real quantum theories uh, finds an explanation for all possible setups, then the real quantum theories wins again. Okay, is the problem here to, to everyone? Okay. Good. No complaints? Good. Okay, so now uh, let's try to be... Uh, st let's try to start with simple things, okay? So now... Let's see what happens if the complex uh, quantum theories comes with, say, the simplest quantum experiment you can think of, okay, in which you generate statistics, in which you make measurements on a quantum system, okay? Well, here for simplicity, I'm taking just one prepar a preparation of a single state in the theory, but you can put more, as you will see. I mean, I'm not going to do it, but it's evident to see. I ah, yeah, switch off, no? I don't know what I have to do. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it's a problem with the. Or maybe I press a bot. No, no, because here is fine. But I think it's more. Okay, okay. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, maybe, so. uh, maybe I, I, I shouldn't. Uh, okay, it was. Okay, so. All what I'm going to say, you can put also different state preparation, different measurements, and uh, you can apply what I'm going to say. Okay, so for simplicity, let me just take the situation in which you perform a measurement on a quantum state, okay? And again, the, what I'm saying, the complex physicist explains everything with complex operators, okay? And now, it, as a challenge, uh, the complex physicist gives this to the real quantum physicist, who has to reproduce these statistics, okay, using real operators, okay? This is, again. So, uh, let, I will show you a way in, in which you can do it, okay? So, what the, the, the real quantum physics does, uh, doubles the dimension by introducing an extra qubit, not surprisingly, I would say. And for this extra qubit, uh, the, comp the real quantum physics is going to use uh, these two states, plus and minus i, which are the eigenstates of sigma y, okay? You see here, they are defined here, they are orthogonal. And now, uh, uh, the real physicist takes the, the state and he writes this different state in which uh, takes the state and the complex conjugate. Well, if the state is real, this will factorize, but if not, you have here two different states. And he adds this extra qubit in this correlated state with plus i and minus i. Okay, it's very easy to see that this state is real because if you take the complex conjugation, this goes into this state and this goes into this state, but the weight is the same, is one half. And uh, you apply the same trick for the measurement, okay? So you take the measurement operators, you put with the initial measurement with i and the complex conjugate with uh, minus i. Everything is real. They simply, these operators simply act in a dimension twice the initial one, okay? Because you have added this extra qubit. And now, since probabilities are real, the, the probability is equal to the complex conjugate, which means that it's equal to, you put, put the complex conjugates here. And now if you make this product, you have once this plus this, 
okay? But they are equal, so you have the probabilities. Well, this is, I hope everyone follows what I'm doing. It's very simple, okay? Okay, so now probabilities are just described by uh, uh, this, but also by these real operators, and the real physicist is happy. He won, okay? Well, you should understand this is the logic, okay? So here, I don't want, again, I don't want to say anything about dimensions, okay? So the real physicists can look for arbitrary operators in real quantum theory, giving rise to the correlations. That's fine, because then there won't be any experiment falsifying, because the real quantum physicists can always provide an explanation. It might be weird, but it's a valid explanation using uh, real quantum theory. Okay, so I don't think there is anything fundamental in this real model, let's say, okay? It's just a way of reproducing the numbers, okay? I'm not saying that all states in real quantum theory have to have this form. I'm not saying this, okay? They are arbitrary real operators. For the game, the way it is phrased, it's enough if the real quantum physics finds an explanation with potentially super weird states. It doesn't matter, okay? So I'm not saying that real quantum theory is a theory made of operators having this form. Okay, I'm not saying this. I'm saying that this is just a real explanation for the experiment. Because this is enough to prove that a real quantum theory is unfalsifiable in this scenario. Again, what did I do? What should I ask? So are you sure it's not me? Uh, a, real, a real theorist. Well, I'm an engineer, as you know. Yeah, yeah. Long time ago. It's here, yes. Now it's coming. Hopefully. Uh, yes, thank you. Well, and just for the records, I mean, you can also, and some of what you do here, there is a, the, some of the extra qubit, the part going with I follows the, the initial explanation using uh, your state and, and, and unitary operation and measurement. And then the, the minus i follows the complex conjugation. Some of you are evolving these two things and you might need it. You, you, so this is a way of somehow combining the, the, the initial state and the complex through always uh, real operators, okay? And then you can see that the, using this trick, you could somehow you can also cover unitary operations. But okay, this is just a comment about what I'm going to say. Also, again, this is not the only real explanation, okay? So there is one which is trivial, which is, uh, uh, you take this state, okay? I mean, you can do many things, huh? You are, are allowed to do whatever you want with your real quantum theory. So another possibility is that you define th this is the state of the system and the measurement, the only thing it does, when you plug here the, the phi r, then you pick up only one of those and you have the probability. This is another explanation, okay? Potentially with larger dimension, or you can also have, for instance, if you have different preparations, you can simply have rho p, which is the preparation, okay? And then you can have the measurement which looks at the preparation and flips a coin with the corresponding probability. Okay, this is another possible explanation using real quantum theory. Okay. All of them are valid. They have different dimensions, who cares? I mean, if you care about dimensions, maybe this is relevant, but we don't. So for instance, here's something that uh, probably is proven, I don't know, it's like proving that for this case, uh, you need really at least twice the dimension for real uh, quantum theory. Okay, I don't know about this question. It's not, I don't find it, it's not relevant for my talk, but this is something that one may be interested in, okay? Just to say that there are many different real realizations for the quantum experiment. Okay, so maybe we're a bit too naive, no? Because how can you expect to prove such a result using single systems? So maybe you have to do something more complex. And we know that quantum theory becomes really interesting when you have, uh, say, uh, different systems, okay? You have entanglement, bell no locality, and then you may have more interesting phenomena. So maybe this is the place where to look for the gap between complex and real uh, quantum theory. Well, it's, in principle, this is not guaranteed, okay? So if you take CHSH, which is the paradigmatic, paradigmatic example for Bell inequality, well, you reach the maximal violation of CHSH with uh, real operators, okay? So this is the state, real, 
And these are the measurements, all of them real. Okay, so, well, no locality may help, but in principle, it's not, say, uh, sufficient for that, because I can even reach the maximal violation of the Bell inequality, the Thielson box, okay, with, with real operators. Well, but maybe you can have a smarter construction. So, for instance, there is a, a Bell inequality, which is a linear combination of CHSA. So, what you do here, you see, I have this labeling. One and two defines the labels for the settings. And somehow there is a violation between setting one and two on Alice and one and two on Bob, and then a CHSA violation between one and three on Alice and three and four on Bob, and a CHSA setting between two and three for Alice and five and six on Bob. Okay. And if you look, what is the possible maximal violation of this inequality? Well, it's at, at most three times two square root of two, which is the maximal violation of each, each single Bell inequality. And you know, to get two square root of two for CHSA, you need to implement uh, non commuting measurements. Okay. So if you take this real, this has to be XZ. And then sigma y has to appear somewhere if you want to find the maximum violation of this inequality using uh, qubits. And it, indeed, it is the case, okay? If you want to find the maximum violation of this with qubits, this is the construction. And then sigma y appears, complex numbers, so you may say, oh, here there is a good uh, possible uh, possibility to falsify real quantum theory. Okay, so again, this is the game, no? So we are uh, in the situation in which we have a composite system. So you prepare, I'm, I will do it for two parties, but you can extend it for any number of parties. So you'll prepare a complex uh, composite state and you will distribute these particles to different locations and you will make measurements and you will have some statistics. Again, this is the probability of getting an output, giving an input for the prepared state. This is the quantum, what the standard complex quantum theory tells. Everything is complex. So now the real quantum theorist has to do the same. Well, the problem is that if you only have one qubit here, well, you don't know what to do with the qubit, whether you should send it to Alice and Bob as we did, okay? But this is not a big problem. You, you have to add a qubit for each particle in the game. Okay, so you double each local dimension if you want. So you put an extra qubit here that goes to Alice and an extra qubit that goes to Bob. So some of you apply the same trick as before. And, uh, and then you construct this state. You see here, you put a plus i, one goes to Alice. Okay, maybe I should have written here a prime, b prime. Okay, there is this i, one i goes to Alice, and one i goes to Bob, and then another one goes to Alice and Bob, a minus i. And then each local measurement, I use one of these extra qubits to apply the same trick as before. I mean, I believe if you more or less follow what I was saying, you will be convinced that this reproduces the previous uh, uh, measurement, um, the previous statistics. Okay, so some of what happens here is that you use cor classical correlations to synchronize this i and minus y that tells to the parties whether to apply the initial measurement or the complex conjugate. Some of this is the idea. Okay, this is not what is happening because everything is present in terms of real operators. But some of the intuition is that this i tells whether the received state is raw or raw complex conjugate, and then whether you should implement the measurement or the complex measurement operator. Okay. Everything is real, okay? But this is just an intuition about the construction. This is what's presented in this paper by, by Nicola, Matthew McKay, and Michele Mosca. Okay, so again, the real quantum physicist is happy. Okay, let me just say something. So here, for instance, if you think about some of the previous real strategies I gave, they don't work. So for instance, these strategies, this is nothing by a local model, okay? So these strategies, if you have a Bell violation, these real quantum strategies don't work. But the one with the extra qubit does work here. Okay, so this is, I have my freedom as real quantum theories. I can, it's enough for me to find a strategy that works, okay? To prove that you won't have an experiment to falsify real quantum theory. Okay, so the poor complex quantum theorist is a bit upset. He tries again and, and says like, okay, Apart from Bell theorem, there are other theorems like the Pusey, Barrett, Rudolph uh, paradox in which what I do is precisely the opposite. It's not that I prepare a state and I make local measurements, but I have independent preparations and I make measurements on the particles. Okay, so you can try this. So you have some preparations here, some other preparation here, and you make measurements on the particles. Okay, this is the way it reads. Okay, so for instance here, uh, Okay, I don't have a proof of this, but I think it's an interesting question. I believe the previous strategy doesn't work. Okay, so this qubit strategy won't work. So, but there is a strategy that works, which is again this prepare and measure. Okay, so this sort of local model. So you encode the preparation using a basis, you encode here the preparation using another basis, and this is the measurement. And when you combine these things, everything is real. Okay, you use a real computational basis. This is real, this is a real measurement. 
when you combine the two things, you reproduce the, the statistics, okay? I think I don't have a proof. I think the qubit strategy doesn't work, okay? Because you will have this extra qubit telling whether it's raw or raw complex conjugate, you have the same here. And here, sometimes you, you will have to apply no conjugation for the left particle and conjugation for the right particle. This is like partial transposition and transfer transposition may give you problems on an entangling measurement. Okay, so I think this is a situation in which you see that this qubit strategy doesn't work, but I have another one. Okay, again, the real quantum physicist can always do whatever uh, he finds in his theory. Okay, so I think something in, that is interesting is proving that the qubit strategy doesn't work, or for instance, that here you require going beyond double in the dimension. We have some numerical evidence that this might be the case. Okay, so again, we didn't make it. Well, then you see the qubit strategy works in some cases, the real, the uh, local model works in some other cases. What do you need to do? Well, combine everything, okay? So this is the idea, this was our idea. So put tensor products in the states and in the measurements. So use independent preparations and use independent measurements, and maybe you can make it there. Okay, so this, this is the, the scenario we had in mind. So what you have to do is an entanglement swapping experiment in which you have independent preparations of the states and you also have local measurements acting. Well, you here you have an, a joint measurement, but you have local measurements. Okay, and then let's hope that here we can do it, okay? I mean, we were thinking of a, a general quantum network and the simplest quantum network we could think of is the one in a quantum, in a, an entanglement swapping experiment because you have tensor product for the measurements and tensor product for the states. And the setup we took was one in which you make here a, a entanglement swapping. So these are belt tests. And you can see that depending on the measurement by Bob, uh, you will violate this three CHSH bell inequality between Alice and Charlie for all measurement results. Not the same inequality, but a variant of the same inequality just by relabeling. Okay, so you can see that in complex quantum theory, you can have here bell, bell states and make a, a, a bell measurement here so that these parties violate uh, 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 this CHSH three bell inequality for all measurement outputs. Again, not the same inequality, but up to relabeling is the same inequality. What did I do? I pressed too many times. Okay, so this is what we took. So again, if I follow qu quantum theory, the explanation is like, okay, there's a state here, tensor product, another state there, and then uh, there's measurement here, tensor product, another measurement there, and another measurement there. So this is to me the way I use quantum theory to explain this experiment. Okay, and this is what I take uh, for granted. So now the real uh, quantum theorist has to do the same. So he has to take the formula and put here real operators and hope to find an explanation for the same data that you have here. I'm not giving you the list of probabilities. What I'm saying is that it's easy to compute this list of probabilities so that you violate the CHSA three for all outputs here. Actually in the proof, uh, okay, I would say our initial question is to prove that there is no real quantum explanation put in real quantum operators here to the same probabilities as I can get in a, complex quantum experiment, but we can even allow uh, uh, classically correlated preparations here, and it's, this is still impossible. Okay, I mean, some of, we don't need it for the logic of the argument, but this, we can even uh, allow the real quantum physics to use classical correlations in the preparation so that there is not even a tensor product here, but a probabilistic combination of tensor product here for the state preparations. So we can even allow this in the proof. Well, so there is no uh, real quantum explanation for that. What is the intuition? This is the way we, are, we thought about this, is that here you violate a bell inequality, so this uh, local, mod, local hidden variable model is not possible. This real, this real quantum explanation I was using for some of my results. And then you may think whether the qubit strategy will work, but you can see that it doesn't because for that, some of you will need to correlate the flag between Alice and Charlie so that they imp apply the right measurements to violate CHSA3 that requires complex measurements for qubits. So you need to correlate the action of this flag with I and minus I. And for that, you have to perform this measurement. And this you can see that it's difficult and actually it's impossible. Maybe I
But do you have any questions by chance? <laughs> Okay, thank you. Okay, so well, you, when you try to do it with a with a strategy, you see that it fails. Okay, this means that the real qubit strategy fails, but it doesn't mean that there is no real qubit strategy that could explain it using I don't know Hilbert spaces of dimension hundred or whatever. Okay, well, actually, we proved that there is no real simulation. Okay, so this experiment, there is no way you can do it putting real objects here. So the poor real quantum physicists lost the game. And actually, uh, we can even find a Bell inequality, Bell type inequality for real quantum theory. Okay, so this is, uh, you can take this CHSA3 and, and condition on the measurement output and sum them up. And well, there is a, uh, you can construct with this a, a standard Bell inequality for the three parties. And now you can optimize this uh, Bell inequality for, uh, for real quantum theory of Hilbert space dimension using tricks a la, say, MPA, or actually we use a, a variant of MPA by Moroder and co workers. And uh, you can obtain a bound by real quantum theory. And then, well, this is basically what I was telling you. So you have like three times two square root of two now for this variance of the CHSA Bell inequality, which is larger than this. So there is a gap. And now, once you have a real a Bell inequality, then you can go and make the experiment. So you can falsify real quantum theory with this result. Something that was impossible before, okay? Because we didn't have any situation in which a gap between the two things appeared, between the two theories. So actually, that was, a, well, I'm not sure about, uh, I don't know, of course, all papers in the, uh, in the history of physics, but I, I, I said that that was really a ultra fast experimental violation because these are our theory work and then uh, an experimental uh, implementation appeared by the group of Zhang Wei Pan. It was really, uh, it was about to violate causality. So it was really, boom. <laughs> but this is because actually it is, Luckily, no, it's only an entanglement swapping experiment, let's say, okay? I think this is nice that uh, at the very end, the proof, well, it's not a complex belt test, but it's slightly more than a belt test, okay? So this is why they could do it so quickly. So, man, this is what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Antonio. So we have plenty of time for questions. Marco. So thank you. Well, I find this work super interesting. And but I want like, is it possible, do you think, to find another way to show that complex numbers are important? For example, like you need to assume that Alice and Charlie, they perform Measurements, they are independent, right? And I agree that if you say like you bought like my measurement from one shop and you go to another shop, I think it's very plausible. But if you want to go for like an adversarial scenario, if you consider an eavesdropper, this assumption is super strong, right? Depending. So do you expect to have like some kind of device independent certification or where you, do you think it's possible, is it possible to drop this assumption basically and still show that complex numbers are required? Okay, so, uh, well, first of all, uh, I would like to say that contrary to, uh, say, device dependent or even the Bell test, here the game is between two quantum believers, okay? It's not that you are fighting against a conspiracy of nature for a theory that you don't know yet, so it's just people who, say, are uh, reasonable <laughs> and believe in quantum theory, okay? So, well, um, but they are two quantum believers, so they are going to place almost with the same rules of the game, so they are used to put tensor products everywhere. Okay, so this is the first thing, but okay, you are fully aware of what no, I, I agree. Okay. From this perspective, it's yes. of course very yes. plausible and yes. super fair. But actually what, what our results imply, I mean, all the, the, the construction I was having, no, is that, well, you really need to put a tensor product here and a tensor product there. Because if you don't put them, if you don't put any tensor product, I'm sorry for you, but then you are back here. Yeah. And then I can find it. If you don't put a tensor product here, I can find it. I can do it. So they also tell you that these tensor products at the preparations and at the measurements are really uh, uh, an essential step in the proof. Otherwise, it's impossible. Yeah, no, I want like maybe with some creativity, we can come up with a 
different path for the same final conclusion? I don't know. Okay, I don't, yeah, okay, creativity, there are never uh, boundaries to creativity, no? But I think all these results tell you that at least with these rules, okay, you really need tensor products for the state separation measurements because if not, all the constructions I was giving you tell you that, I mean, it might be a bit weird, but it will be a proper quantum explanation for the statistics you see in the experiment. And it's nice that at least for the states, you allow no shared randomness already. It's simply, this is better for the experimental demonstration, yes. Thank you. So we have Brian, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, it's just a follow-up question to Marco Tullio's question. Um, so maybe it's not really about your work, but uh, about the experimental realization that you mentioned afterwards. Um, is there like a, what kind of uh, measures are taking into account to? Uh, certify that the causal structure of the experiment is actually that one that resembles this like uh, bipartite common causes but not a tripartite common cause like okay, is I there because I, I understand that if you are like trying or like testing a real quantum theory believer versus a quantum a complex quantum theory believer that you can assume that you know both of them theoretically assume the same causal structure but if what you want to do is say nature versus a real uh, quantum theory believer, then you need to certify that your experiment that you're performing actually has this particular causal structure that you are uh, studying. Mm -hmm. So do you know if in the experiment they did something along these lines or? Well, I must confess I didn't read the experimental paper. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, so maybe one of my co-authors who are here read it and they can mention, I don't know, Miriam, Nicola, David, who is uh, brave enough to... Nicola, come on, you're not shy. I'm sure you have something to say. <laughs> this experiment... Oh, sorry. Thank you. So the, 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 this experiment by J. Wilpern's uh, group was using uh, superconducting qubits, so everything is within, let's say, a millimeter. And indeed, to guarantee independence on one chip is uh, is more an assumption than a, than a fact, let's say. So you can argue against that. On the other side, it was a, a nice experiment, and all the data are certainly very highly plausible and so on. But the assumption that you are questioning is, you or who was it there, <laughs> Sorry. Um, is indeed questionable. Yeah, but okay. So Again, I see a bit different here the discussion with respect to uh, belt tests. No? So usually in belt tests, we care about locality and then we invoke space-like separations. But uh, I think we have other ways in within quantum theory to put tensor products. We are used to put tensor products. I mean, we constantly put tensor products in uh, setups. No? So I mean, to me, if you have, uh, I don't know, like I'm thinking about a photonics implementation in which you have uh, two crystals that are pumped, okay? They will be pumped with something that comes maybe from the same, uh, uh, electrical power uh, electrical power plant okay well yes sure okay you have this pumping into crystals and then this goes to two separate locations i will feel safe to put a tensor product yeah, so i think but uh, okay in this experiment it's more questionable the locality the locality assumption um, just the obvious question uh, given what we heard this morning uh, did you uh, you probably tried quaternions right no i didn't uh, Again, if my co-authors oh, come, <laughs> but uh, us okay. Yes. So the question would be if we can find something dis with dis quaternions. Separate that they, quaternions. From, yes. Yeah. It could be that you can do something with quaternions that you cannot do with. Uh, Maybe that way around. Yeah. Yes. Uh, probably, I think you will get signaling somehow. Quaternions. It's very hard to squeeze in into non-signaling. Yeah, I didn't. I, yeah, I was thinking. Uh, I knew I was going to get this question, but I didn't this morning after the this morning. Okay, good. Now we have online questions from online participants. Um, should I check Hi. it or? Uh... No, no, you are good. So. Hi, can you hear me? Hello. Hello. Um. No? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, I wrote the the question in the chat. Just uh, if Tony wants to read it, but basically my my question was that. In the setup, like we are talking about, uh, hello. hello. Can you Question hear me? Question from online participants. You can, you can ask. Hi. Hello. 
Uh, Hi. Uh, we speaking now? Yeah, they, it looks like they're trying to speak. But they, they can hear me. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. If you okay, want, you sorry. can turn on your video. We, we, we can see you, but you don't have to. Um, uh, I don't know how to do that, but... Okay, fine, uh, just shoot, shoot okay. a question. Okay. Um, yeah, my question was, we are talking a lot about uh, Tensor products. My question to Tony was if, um, like, the argument allows for, for the real observables, let's say, for the real Alice and Bob to be fermionic, so that you don't have a tensor structure if this it, it is considered in the argument well i'm not sure if uh, i understand i don't see any problem with this i would say i mean uh, i'm not sure if i understand the question because and if you are localized fermions you can assign a measurement yeah, I don't think, uh, well, I mean, for my result, it's enough for me to find a situation where the gap appears. So I'm not sure what, maybe I don't understand the question. Do you expect that the, this may help in other situations where I don't have the gap? I mean, standard quantum theory, let's say that super selection rules may help in, uh, is this your question or? Yes, yes, it's a bit like that. Um, it's if you have restricted too much this scenario to, to impose uh, a tensor, uh, structure be new to, between the two because like you can have other structures that are also allowed by you know signaling like having a wedge product in, in the fermionic case well I don't think I'm restricting no I'm just uh, the scenario I'm just saying that uh, this is a scenario with distinguishable particles and the real quantum theory will apply the same rules as a uh, standard quantum theory I'm not sure if I I wouldn't say I restrict it. For me, it's enough to find a situation in which the gap appears, and that's the end of the story, I would say. Maybe using super selection rules is not entirely clear to me, but maybe you can find a gap for a simpler setup. I'm not sure about this. OK, makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I, I did not want to say that you were restricted. I was just uh, wanted to know if uh, if you took into no, consideration this, no, no, this scenario. Yes, thank you. Okay. Can, I, can I ask another question? Okay, good. Hello, you can ask. Yes, okay. Alexei Greenbaum from uh, CA Saclay, France. Thank you, Tony, for this talk. I'm wondering uh, whether you have any intuitive explanation of the origin of that bound 7.066, because we understand, we understand where the square roots of two come for the quantum bound, right? And we, of course, know how classical bounds come about. Do, do you have any heuristic explanation of that kind of strange number? Like, where is that coming from? What's behind that? Okay, now this is a, it's a bit long time since we had this bound. Okay, this bound is derived through this uh, semi-definite programming hierarchy. So no one tells us that uh, this is uh, tight. Okay, now I'm looking at my co-authors, if they can say something. I think we tried to see whether it was tight and we couldn't. So. I would say I suspect that this bound is not tight, so it could be that real quantum theory. So you see, it's just an upper bound to the real uh, quantum uh, violation of the inequality. I would say. Yes. Okay. Okay. I see, so, I see some of my co-authors agree with yeah. what I'm saying. So it's just a computational thing that we don't really understand in theoretical terms yet. Yeah, exactly. So we don't have, uh, say, uh, the maximal quantum violation or maximal value you can get with real quantum theory for this inequality. We don't have, we don't know okay. it. Thank you. Okay. Good. So maybe I, I can ask one question. Question. Perhaps I can argue like a la Billy Wooters because he has done a lot of work along the lines of real quantum theory in saying essentially you should not use the tensor product rule to calculate probabilities. So in your formula for the probability, like this, what you get from the experiments, this can be still like independent probabilities, factorizable, but on the right hand side, you should modify tensor product because real quantum mechanics violates local tomography. So you should, it's just maths, different maths, but you'll get same result. So how would you argue about the like trace formula in using tensor products? Well, I, mean, I cannot argue. This is just an I mean, this is a postulate. No, you cannot argue against that. I would say that still, I'm not sure if I see anything deep in local tomography. I think local. You're not sure, but you can include additional terms from real quantum mechanics. Yes. 
and then the left hand side will still factorize whereas no, right hand I, side will true. not use so no no i mean the tensor product has to be in the right hand side in the equation part because right. if not i mean if you have a, an experiment doing uh, separate locations you will have probabilities that factorize okay but if you forget about the tensor product you will explain the observed probabilities as i was saying with real quantum theory but of course not with the same factorization you expect for the quantum operators i agree with that okay when I'm, i was also saying that uh, in my because these were also comments that we had from some uh, other scientists and colleagues about local tomography you know the fact that you can infer the state by making local measurements i don't see anything uh very but, fundamental but, local but this will like th this fact that there is no local tomography would change the way you calculate probabilities yes. on the right hand side and this is just a mathematical tool to get good probabilities so you can still yes but uh, consistent inside uh, tomography is a concept that is makes sense when you fix the dimension and then you see for me dimension honestly it's just maybe something for simplicity that you take a given dimension but i can take another one but okay this is more uh, Subjective, yeah, uh, okay. uh, statements. Yeah. So maybe one more question from online audience, and then then. Okay, so. Okay. Uh, yes, can, can I ask my question? Yes, please. Okay, this is Bilal. Uh, I think the, your reasoning for constructing the quantum ray theory, theory is quite. I mean, it seems to me quite circle vicious because circle vicious because you are using the not only you are explaining the complex numbers but also you are using but meanwhile you are using the, the quantum language i mean the formalism of the quantum the theory the current one so i think you try to unjustify the quantum theory by using the argument of the quant the current quantum theory it seems like the circle vicious I mean, for example, I have, the, I, sorry, I have some problems. I, I cannot hear you well. I don't know if I think we have a technical problem. We don't understand you very well. Can, can you please repeat? Sorry. The sound okay, is my quite question bad. is this. Uh, do you hear me? Yes, but uh, with the quality is not uh, very good. Okay, I try to do my best. <laughs> okay, sorry. Uh, I said uh, when you are scoring the complex numbers, but still you are using the language of the quantum theory. For example, uh, defining the probabilities, you are using the trace of the, I mean the bone rule. I think this is the this is quite a circle vicious because if you try to define the quantum theory, you shouldn't apply apply or you shouldn't appeal to the current quantum language because in this case, if you, if you do this, you doing something like the circle vicious. It is not reasonable or let's say it is not consistent. Well, For example, I mean the. <laughs> The definition of the probability is not quite true because if you try to do a quantum real theory, you should def define, for example, in, in different way, uh, the probabilities. I mean, well, what can I say? I mean, this is just uh, the way I stated the, in a way, there is nothing ultra convincing that I can give to you. This is the way I stated the problem and or we invented the problem. Well, we invented it. Oh, this is a question that we care about with, uh, with my authors. No? I would say, Perhaps what I would say is that, uh, okay, it might be true what you say, but I think for not, it's so surprising that even using this and real quantum theory, you can reproduce the statistics of any Bell test on Earth, okay, no matter how many particles. So I think perhaps what is uh, the first re surprising result is that with real quantum theory, you can reproduce all Bell tests, all uh, entanglement experiments in which you prepare a highly complex uh, uh, many body state and you make local measurements on these particles, you can reproduce with real quantum theory. So you may not like this theory, okay, well, this is a valid point, but I think it is remarkable that using this limited theory, you can explain all Bell tests you can think of. Okay, and okay it, it doesn't so seem it's, it's, it, it, it might be seem limited, but it has been, let's say, hard to find, or at least it didn't happen until our work, to find a situation in which you can find a gap. And even our proof, it took us a while to, to, to combine these two things, okay? Because you are fighting against a theory that lives in arbitrary spaces, okay, of arbitrary dimension. So I think it's, you may not like it, but this theory might be bad, good, it's enough to explain all entanglement experiments. Okay, I think we should move on. We have one more question and, and, and we have to, to 
to go further. Thank you. So. Hi. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Hi, hi, Tony. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for thanks for your talk. Yeah. Hi, I'm Gemma. Um, I so uh, I liked a lot your work and your talk. And um, but as I said, you showed us that how to falsify. Um, well, the, the kind of a, yeah, an experimental difference between quantum theory and real theory. But I see both as inaccessible anyway, because they rely on these numbers, which require an, an infinite precision. And um, so I wonder what your thoughts are uh, relating to the recent very interesting works by Gizan and Bill Santo, who I see are both in the audience. Um, <laughs> um, on the fact that what we can actually access has finite precision anyway. And um, I mean, that would, that would lead to a different kind of theory for sure, because for example, deterministic theories uh, would become non-deterministic. Um, would that make sense to study kind of different experimental predictions of getting rid of uh, all these numbers that require an infinite precision and um, only using numbers with finite precision? Or uh, I don't know, what are your thoughts in this direction? Because I'm really curious about that. And I really feel that using real or complex numbers is the wrong thing to do. OK, well, this <laughs> OK. Let me just, there is an easy answer for that, which is, uh, well, there is a super easy, which is, uh, I don't know, but uh, okay, let me just say that the experimental proof somehow is robust, okay? So the, the, the bound that you get with real quantum theory, no matter which precision, is seven point something in the best case, okay? And then you beat this with an experiment. So I don't see how these uh, issues could uh, affect this, okay? Because, I mean, it's just a matter of, there is a big gap in there. About uh, I don't know if Nicola on, or wants to say something or <laughs> no about the rest I don't know I I know people in the room know much better than me sorry Gemma I cannot answer for the rest I'm sorry but I think again I mean there is a gap between what real quantum theory can achieve and quantum so even if you have a uh, stuff there to make things imprecise the, the gap will remain good. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Tony. Let's thank Tony once more.